The scriptures so eloquently expressed how God sent manna from heaven to Moses and to the children of Israel in the wilderness. Today, God has appointed a man, a brother, a Levite, a friend, our leader and pastor, your host and facilitator, Bishop C. Sean Tyson. Good morning to those of you that are coming in to the Bible class. Good morning. I'm going to ask you to hit those share buttons as you come in. And in just a minute, we'll get into our lesson for this morning. The song was just in my spirit. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground. God bless you, my friend, Pastor Tyrone Kaiser. God bless you, saints. As you come in, hit those share buttons. And we're going to get to the word of the Lord in just a moment. Bless you, my friend, Pastor Casey Hayes. Everything is big in Texas, they say. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to say the precious, powerful, glorious name of Jesus. Lord, we are honored and thankful for another opportunity to 
gather our hearts and our minds around the word of God. For man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We need your word like never before. We can't live without it. We don't know what to do without it. We have no direction without it, no insight, no understanding. We need your word, and we're hiding your word in our hearts that we may not sin against you. Now I pray, Lord, that the word of God shall be enlightened in every heart and in every mind and in every soul and in every spirit. I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would teach through us on this morning. Give us the mind of Christ and give us the will to do the will of God. Look upon your people everywhere across this nation and around the world in these perilous and these trying times. Our confidence, our hope, our faith is in the eternal God, the changeless God. You who are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We are putting our trust in you and leaning not to our own understanding. Stretch forth your hand and heal and deliver, set free and saved by the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will give you praise. There's none like you. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen. Well, God bless you on this morning, saints, and welcome once again to this midday man of Bible study. And I'm just grateful that the Lord has allowed us once again the opportunity to share with you what the Spirit of God has placed in my heart from his word. As you know, if you've been following our teachings, we are teaching a verse-by-verse -verse study on the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, it was especially impressed upon me by the Holy Spirit to teach this verse-by-verse -verse, uh, series on the book of Revelation. And we're now at lesson number 20. And God is revealing himself to us and revealing his will as we move through this book of Revelation, and I'm glad that you've joined me once again on today for lesson number 20 on the book of Revelation. Now, before I get into my lesson, I want to send my love and my greetings to the Calvary and the Christ Church family and to all of the saints of God everywhere. And just in case someone is joining us for the first time on this morning, I hope this won't be your last time studying the word of God with us. And we have a greeting that we want to send to you. And everybody that's able, I'd like for you to type it in the comment section. The greeting to all of our guests and our visitors on today, these words, you belong here. That's the way we say it at Calvary in Christ Church. You belong here. This is the place where everybody is somebody Nobody is a stranger, and you belong here. Well, I'm not going to hold you a long time because we have noonday prayer coming up at 12 noon, and I'm sure many of you want to share in the ministry of intercession, but just a few minutes from the word on today, the book of Revelation, lesson number 20, and today we are beginning, we won't finish, but we're beginning our study of the church at Pergamos. Now, just by way of brief review, the letters to the seven churches share a similar structure. They each feature these characteristics. Number one, an address to a particular congregation in that space of time in Asia Minor, literal churches, literal congregation with literal pastors in the first century. Secondly, you will find an introduction of Jesus by Jesus. All throughout the book of Revelation, you have self-descriptive terms that Jesus gives concerning himself to the churches at Asia Minor. Thirdly, the Lord Jesus gives an assessment 
of the condition of the church. Number four, after he gives an assessment of the condition of the church, he gives a verdict from his perspective concerning what's good about the church and what needs correction in the church. Number five, the Lord gives a command to every church. Number six, he gives a general exhortation to all believers in all church ages. And finally, number seven, he gives the promise of reward. So that is the general outline of each letter. And I'd like for you to pick me up in Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 12. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 12. As we are now in lesson number 20 on the book of Revelation, the church at Pergamos. We're reading together aloud where we can. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. By way of context, Pergamos was a great city. It was, in fact, the capital city of Asia Minor. At the time when Jesus, through John, is writing this letter, Pergamos had been the capital city of that region for more than 300 years. The city was noted for its culture, for its education. Pergamos had one of the great libraries of the ancient world with over 200,000 volumes in the Pergamos City Library. It was a city that was consumed with the pursuit of knowledge, which I must stop to say is not always synonymous with the pursuit of God. The scripture teaches that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So then anytime a person attempts to extract the pursuit of the knowledge of God from their learning, they will never come to the knowledge of the truth. The scripture said, ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Pergamos was also a very religious city. In Pergamos, you had temples to both Greek and Roman gods, Dionysus, Athena, Dedimer, and Zeus. In Pergamos, you had three temples that were dedicated to the worship of of the Roman emperor. Emperor worship was a very uh, entrenched part of the culture of the city. I thought it was interesting to discover that Pergamos also had the first temple that was built in Asia Minor for the worship of Caesar Augustus. So I think you can see that Pergamos was a city that was inundated with idolatry, inundated with false worship. Pergamos could be likened to, uh, in America, Minneapolis, Minnesota, the great uh, institution of, of healing, the Mayo Clinic in Minneapolis. It could be likened to Cleveland, Ohio, the Cleveland Clinic. It was known as a center of the worship of the deity known as Eclipios. Eclipios was represented by the serpent. There was a huge medical school in Pergamos, and people would come from all around the known world to that medical center seeking relief and healing for their bodies. So it was a great cultural center. It was a great medical center, and it was a religious center, which is not to be confused with a spiritual place. Revelation 2 and verse number 12, the B clause, these things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. 
back in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 16, John observes of Jesus that out of his mouth went a two-edged sword. Jesus now shows that two-edged sword to the church at Pergamos. The description of the sword projecting from the mouth of Jesus allows us to associate that symbol with the word of God. Jesus will now confront the church at Pergamos and confront the church in every age with his word, with the intent that the word of God would pierce the heart and pierce the soul of the hearer. I want to submit to you on this morning that we need more piercing preaching in our time. We need more preaching and teaching that confronts our sin and that challenges our character. One of the most intriguing scriptures to me is when God's people told the prophets of God, prophesy unto us smooth things. Many of you who have just come in the church in the last 15 or 20 years, you would not have been able to endure the kind of piercing preaching that those old school saints like myself and others, you wouldn't be able to handle some of that piercing preaching that we got when we were coming up. I wish I had a witness out there. Those old preachers did not mind hurting your feelings to save your soul. I know some of the some of the new the new saints don't know about about saints meetings. Back in the in the old school church, we used to have saints meetings, and in some of those saints meetings, the pastor would uh, bring under correction a child of God, and at that time it was a it was a public correction. We call it silencing or being sat down. And if the pastor felt like you had a rebellious spirit, that you were not willing to receive the correction, the spiritual correction that he was trying to give to you, well, the pastor many times, he'd call it, call it, you'd be silent, sat down, three months, six months, nine months, a year. And my father used to say, how long you stay down will be determined by your attitude. Back in those days, we would have to stand before the church and make a public apology for what we had done to bring a reproach upon the name of the Lord and upon the house of God, upon the church of God. People, for various reasons, we, we kind of got away from those public type of chastisements. I even know people who began to sue the church uh, for that kind of things, but uh, I'm not a proponent, let me say it this way. I'm not a proponent of using the pulpit as a boxing ring. My dad used to say that the church does not need a spanking every Sunday. But any pastor who refuses to speak biblical correction and rebuke does not really love his or her congregation. You, you, you can't tell me that you love God's people and you will not lift up your vo voice to speak against error in the church. Now, it's not going to make you popular. Everybody's not going to come to your church. You may not have the biggest church in the city, but if you claim to be a spokesman of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you claim to be a shepherd, if you claim to be a prophet, you have a moral and a spiritual responsibility to say to God's people, no matter what the culture is saying, this is what the word, the two-edged sword, this is what the word says about the matter. We're going to have to have more constancy in our time. We're going to have to have more consistency as it pertains to our willingness to hold fast to the truths and the principles of the word of God. God ain't going to change for us. 
God is not going to change his mind just because men are changing their laws. They're not going to change the law of God. They're not, they're not going to change the righteousness of God. God's standard is still follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall be the Lord, shall see the Lord. And when people really want to be saved, they will appreciate when someone says, hey, we're going in the wrong direction. When people really want to be saved, they will be grateful. I appreciate you being concerned about my soul. I appreciate you pointing out, pointing that out to me. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to ask the Lord to, to give me a new heart, a clean heart, a right spirit when people really want to be saved. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 5. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 5. Now, I know this isn't popular, but, it, but, it, but it's necessary. Hebrews 12 and 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Verse number 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Verse 7, listen to this. If ye endure chastening, praise the Lord, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Verse 8, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards, and not sons. Verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Listen to me, students. Listen to me, class. Listen to me, young people. You will never go anywhere in God without subjecting yourself to spiritual leadership. You can't be here, there, everywhere, sitting at everybody's table, eating everybody's food. You're going to have to submit yourself to spiritual authority and, and develop that father-son, that mother-daughter relationship with those leaders who are seasoned in the faith. Prayerfully, there are some things that we have been through, some experiences that we have had that we are able to share with you, warn you of, so you don't have to bump your head on the same walls we did. Verse number 10, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, watch this, that we might be that we might be partakers of his holiness. And finally, verse number 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. When a saint really want to be saved, I don't care how much they mess up. I don't care how bad they mess up. When you really want to be saved, something down in your soul tells you, I've got to make a change. I've got to get up from here. I've got to go in another direction. No chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. I want to say this very respectfully to every preacher, every pastor. Never get personal over the pulpit. Stay biblical. Why do you say that, Pastor Tyson? The reason I say that is because the word will do the work. You don't never want to get up in the pulpit. Uh, dealing with personal grievances with people. You got 100, 200, 300 saints that have come to the worship service, need a word from the Lord, need direction, need encouragement, need enlightenment. The last thing they need after fighting just to get to the house of God 
in these times is you getting up over the pulpit, spinning the whole message, fussing at one person. Are you kidding me? Never make it personal. Keep it biblical. I, can I get somebody to type in the comment section, the word will do the work. The word will do the work. Never make it personal. Always keep it biblical. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 12. I'm moving along here so we can get ready for noonday prayer. Hebrews 4 and 12. Talking about that sword that was proceeding from the mouth of Jesus. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All right, let's go back to the text in Revelation chapter 2. Let's pick it up in verse number 13. Verse number 13. All right, class, let's read. I know thy works. And where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. I know your works. Jesus said that to each church. And Jesus is saying that to every child of God. He knows our works. He knows what we have done. He knows what we have not done. That we should have done. That we still have opportunity to do. I hear you, Holy Ghost. Many times our emphasis is on sins of commission, things that we've done that we shouldn't do. But for most saints, our struggle is with sins of omission, the things that we should have done that we did not do. This morning, the Holy Ghost told me to call some of you out of retirement. Somebody said, Pastor, what you talking about? The Holy Ghost said, Son, when you when you start teaching Bible class, I have some workers. How did old shit did up old son? I have some workers who have gone AWOL, that have walked off the job. And I want you to use your apostolic authority to call them out of retirement today. I've noticed something. I've been around a while now and had an opportunity to interact with great saints and great churches. A lot of times saints won't do anything in ministry if they cannot do what they used to do. I want to exhort you against taking on that mentality. If they can't do what they used to do, they won't do anything. That's immature. That's selfish. It's offensive to God, and it's detrimental to the body of Christ. Because the scripture said, every joint supply it. So whenever you withhold your ministry, whenever you walk off the job, whenever you go AWOL, whenever you abandon your post, whenever you are not in your place doing what God has called and anointed you to do, the whole body suffers. And we are in a season where we need all hands on deck. Everybody type that in the comment section, all hands on deck. We see the devil is losing his mind. We see everything that is happening in the world, everything that is happening in our culture, in society. We need saints to be on their post. And a lot of times, if we can't do what we used to do, then someone will say, well, I, I'm just not going to do nothing. 
Listen, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. It was a time, those of you that know my ministry, there was a time when, when I used to play the organ or the piano in every service. I was faithful to that. That was a season in my life. I was at every choir rehearsal. I played for every wedding free of charge. I didn't charge people to play for their wedding. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but that was just my gift to the couple. I played for every funeral. I have never. I've been playing over 30 years. I've never charged the family to play for a funeral. It was my gift to the family. I played for Christ Church for 30 years. Every Sunday morning, every Sunday night. Come on, Bishop Jeffrey Brandon, where you at? I need a witness. Howard Patterson, where you at? I need a witness. 30 years. Every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every choir rehearsal, every Bible class, every saints meeting, every engagement, every council, every convention, and didn't get a D-I-M-E. That spells dime. <laughs> That's for all of y'all that got to be paid for everything you do in the church. I played for Christ Church for 30 years. Not a D-I-M-E. <laughs> I remember the first time I went in to have a conversation with the Honorable Bishop James Edison Tyson <sighs> about the possibility of a stipend. <laughs> Man, Bishop looked at me like he was going to jump over that desk. I said, never mind, never, never mind, never mind. I, I, I get with you later, Bishop. Went on out the office. And you know, it wasn't that Bishop was against blessing people because he believed in that. Now, don't go, don't go lying and say he didn't believe in blessing people because he did. I've seen Bishop empty his pocket, his wallet, and his bank account blessing people. So it wasn't a matter of whether or not he felt like people needed to be blessed or even compensated fairly in ministry. His thing was, don't do it for the money. Do it for God. Do it for the kingdom. Do it because you love the Lord. Do it because you love the church. Do it because you love the saints. Do it because he did it for you. So once he once he felt like uh, my heart was right, then he called me back in and we had a different kind of conversation. But what I'm saying to this point is, just because you cannot do what you used to do, doesn't mean that you're supposed to go sit down somewhere and, and say, I, I, I ain't going to do nothing now. I can't keep up with what these young men and young women with Johnny, John Austin and LaRon Rainey and, and Joe Logan and so forth. I can't keep up with Eddie and all. I can't keep up with Al 10. I can't keep up with all that. But just because I'm not at the top of the ladder anymore because in, in my music ministry doesn't mean I can't do anything. If you cannot do what you used to do, the least you can do is teach someone how to do what you did so ministry can continue. I, would, I ain't getting no amens out here. I ain't getting no amen. I, I ain't getting no amen. I guess I'm going to have to say amen myself. Amen, Reverend. If you can't do what you used to do, at least teach somebody else how to do it so the ministry can go on. And celebrate them and push them and appreciate them and pour into them and stop being so doggone territorial. You have to allow God the opportunity to transition you to the untapped you. The Holy Ghost is speaking here this morning 
Allow God the opportunity to transition you to the untapped you. I don't know who God's talking to here, but I hear him. Because you are great at what you do does not mean that's all you can do. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 1. Because you are good at what you do doesn't mean that's all you can do. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 1. Always be more concerned about edifying than glorifying. And by that, I mean, if nobody knows you're doing it, if you don't get any credit for it, you're doing it unto the edification of, of the body of Christ and not to receive personal glory. So if you won't do anything, it makes me wonder why you were doing what you were doing. I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 1. The Holy Ghost told me to get up this morning and call you out of retirement. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry... As we have received mercy, we faint not. Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 10 says it this way. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Let's go back to the text. And where you dwell, Revelation chapter, chapter number 2. We're studying the church at Pergamos. I'm in Revelation chapter number two. Pick me up there in the scripture, please. All right, here we are. And where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Pergamos was a stronghold city. Stronghold city like San Francisco. Pergamos was a stronghold city, like Chicago. Pergamos was a stronghold city, like New York City. Pergamos was a stronghold city, like New Orleans. Those of you who travel, and I'm a, I need some to witnesses out here, those of you that, that travel, have traveled, can testify that every city and every state has a different spirit over it and in it. Detroit has a different spirit than Indianapolis. You can feel the shift when you cross over from South Bend into Niles, Michigan, it's an immediate shift. Every city, every state has a different spirit over it and in it. Now, Chicago and Detroit are not that far away, but the spirits of the two cities are totally different. When you cross over, from Richmond, Indiana, and cross that line where that big arch is, over into Ohio, as soon as you cross into Ohio, the spirit changes. There's a different spirit in, in different regions of the country. The North East has a spirit of its own. The South has its own spirit. Midwest got its spirit. Pacific Northwest has a spirit. West has a spirit. I went to preach in Massachusetts and I, 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 I'm accustomed to dealing with stronghold spirits, principalities, powers, witchcraft and all that stuff. But I had never preached in Massachusetts before. And as God is in heaven, 
when I walked in the foyer of the hotel, two witches were sitting in the lobby waiting on me. And when I was, when I got through checking in at the desk, they said, we've been waiting on you. They knew I was coming and they didn't find out on Facebook. Pergamos, there are certain places before you go to minister, you have to go into an intensive prayer and fasting before you go into that region if you're going to be affected. I never go preach in the Northeast without going on a three-day fast before I go out there. I've told the story, some of you have heard me tell the story about uh, and this was my first time preaching in San Francisco. First time preaching out there. I, I preached all over California, but I had never preached in San Francisco for whatever the reason. But I preached out there and the saints at Christ Church in Calvary know about this. I preached all day. I was tired. My guard was down. I was ready to relax. And... I was walking through the airport in San Francisco and this woman walked up to me and said, I know you. And she hugged me. I normally, I, I normally don't let people hug, get that close to me that I don't know. But I was tired and she seemed friendly. She hugged me. I know you. I said, God bless you, ma'am. I, I said, where do you know me from? She said, here, there, and everywhere. That spirit. And when she let go of me, this chill went through my whole body. I said, oh, Lord, what have I done? Letting that woman touch me. When my plane landed in Indianapolis, I was 100% deaf in my left ear. That witch put something on me. I was deaf in my left ear and was deaf for several weeks. And some of you may have heard of Bethlehem Healing Temple in Chicago, Illinois. The late uh, Matty B. Poole and Bishop Poole. Ha! Glory to God. Now, Bishop and Mother Poole have been gone home to be with the Lord, you know, 30 years. And I, I went there to preach. Bethlehem Healing Temple. This is something about the... Ah, man, I'm out of time. About these churches like Christ Church. Calvary, other churches like that, where there's a concentration of prayer. Let me tell you something. Without me, one of the under shepherds, one of the pastors, one of the mothers or missionaries ever having to lay hands on you, you can walk in Christ Church Apostolic or Mount Calvary Pentecostal Church and get healed. Boom! When you walk in the door. I'm trying to tell you what I know. I walked in Bethlehem Healing Temple. And I've been, uh, it was so frustrating and so uncomfortable. And, and when I came in, Mother Maddie B. Poole had established, she had a group that would pray in, uh, in intervals all throughout the service. Bishop Wagner used to do that at Mount Calvary. My dad used to do it at Christ Temple. He would have certain people go in the prayer room and they would be praying Throughout the whole service. Well, I had Ata Shemo Kosana. Hold on, I'm on say. Kiana Moshe Kiata. I had I had to walk through the prayer chapel to get to the pulpit. And when I when I walked through the prayer chapel, that group that prays throughout the service, they were in there praying. And when I walked in the room, bam, my ear opened up. I'm trying to tell you there is power 
in apostolic prayer. So Pergamos, Pergamos was that, it was a stronghold city. Uh, it, it was a stronghold city because of all the pagan religions. It was a stronghold city because there was a huge altar in Pergamos that was dedicated to the Roman god Zeus, the god of lightning. Pergamos was the center of the ancient Babylonian priesthood. It was a stronghold city. And as I shared with you in the beginning of the class, it was a city that was steeped in emperor worship. But the Lord said to the saints at Pergamos, and I got to close because it's time for noonday prayer. He said, I commend you because you have held fast to my name. Can I say something to you before we go this morning, saints? Don't let the name go down. And we got people now trying to de-emphasize the name of Jesus, trying to de-emphasize water baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I came this morning to tell you, don't let the name go down. Despite the fact that they were living in the most severe anti-Christ surroundings, the saints at Pergamos did not deny the name. Neither did they deny their faith. And Jesus said, Antipas is my faithful martyr who was killed among you. Now, Antipas is not a famous name in church history. Antipas is not a name that would immediately come to the forefront of Christians' minds. But Antipas is one of the great almost anonymous heroes of the Bible. And I want to say to someone this morning, the Lord told me to tell you, you are never unnoticed by God. Nobody, nobody had mentioned Antipas' name in the scripture until Jesus mentioned his name. And Jesus said, that's, that's my man. <laughs> Come on, Holy Ghost. I don't care if your name is not up in lights. The Lord knows your works. I don't care if they never call your name over the pulpit. God knows your sacrifices. I don't care if they don't never make you the head over an auxiliary. God knows what you have done to his name. And did you know that the name Antipas it means against all. And the word martyr is from an older Greek word, martus, which means this is true and I know it. So Antipas was against everything that was against God. He was against everything that was against the name of Jesus. He was against everything that was against truth. And he became a martyr, a martyr. This is true. And I know it. There are just some things, some experiences that you have with God, some things that God shows you, reveals to you manifesting your life and in your spirit and can nobody talk you out of what you know. Now I tell you what I know. I know there's power in the name of Jesus. I'm going to tell you what I know. I know the Holy Ghost is real. I'm going to tell you what I know. I know that prayer works. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you what I know. I know there's power in the blood of Jesus. Don't you let these modern new age know-it-all folk, Johnny come lately, come up in here and tell you what you know you don't know. The devil is a liar. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hold fast to what you know and earnestly contend for the faith. This is true, and I know it.
That's enough for right now. I'm going to leave the word of the Lord with you this morning, now afternoon, as we prepare for noonday prayer at the church. Remember, the church is open for noonday prayer on Thursday and Friday. So if you want to swing by the church and get on the altar, come on. Come on. Altar is open. Sanctuary is open. Come on in and have a little talk with Jesus. Saints, if you haven't had an opportunity to worship God in your midweek offering, be sure to do that. Be sure to honor the Lord with a midweek offering. And if for any reason you're going to be out of town over the weekend, be sure that you honor the Lord with the Kingdom 10. We call the tithe the Kingdom 10. The first 10% of our income and our increase back to the work of the Lord. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. Have a smile upon you. You all keep your mask on. Wear your mask when you're out in public, when you're around people that are not in your inner circle. Somebody said, I've been back. I have both vaccines. Again, I say, keep your mask on when you are out around people that are not in your inner circle. And the church said, amen. Stay safe, stay saved, and stay supernatural. I'll see you in prayer. God bless you, Savior. Love you all.